Who? Hey, how are you? Good. How you doing? Doing oh, well. Oh, all right. I'm here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh no, thank you for a wonderful for, afternoon. Yeah, thank you for reaching out. You know, like you're you're one of those people that I've always seen in the industry when I go to the trade shows and when I go to the consumer events, but I've never had the, the pleasure of actually speaking to. Usually, you're one of those people too that kind of get you have a crowd of people around you who who like want your time and and want to talk to you. So usually, I I kind of skirt by and say, well, I'll try to come back. You know, when the lines you know die down a little and it never dies down, which I guess is a compliment to to you and your brand and how much people are excited to talk to you. No, thank you, thank you. It's just, the shows are kind of <laughs> tough, you know, because you're there to sell. So, and then it's hard to also do, uh, you know, the marketing portion of it. The, uh, you know, you have to justify going to a show. It's very expensive, and then you have to try to also right. put time so you can also talk to people. And it's just, it's very tough to do that. Um, right. You know, some people, like, every year I miss out somebody. Somebody always hits me. And I was like, oh, I didn't have time to talk to him. Like, you know, it's it's it's, it's tough. You know, this year was a different story, though. Or, uh, yeah, last IPCP, I was kind of slow So compared to other years. So I don't know what's what was your thought about that. The show for me was a okay. little, I mean, it was, it was okay. I mean, it's always, for a media person, I mean, you're so busy trying to get around to every booth that you don't, you know, always um, – track I guess how many people are around and stuff like that but I know a lot of other the media uh, outlets definitely said that they noticed you know from year to year to year that it was a little bit down and I know there's a big concern going into this year you know A are, are they going to have it and, and B what would that traffic look like because I mean this situation that we're all in has definitely had a big impact on business so you know yeah it's I don't, uh, I don't, it's <laughs> I don't think it's. I don't know uh, the answer. Well, the thing is, I was telling a friend of mine. Um, there's a show called NAM. It's a uh, National Association of Music uh, Music Producers, and and you know, like they sell everything from software to manufacturing guitars, whatever. It's like one of the biggest shows. They're like, the size of that show is twenty times the size of of a, of a, a PCA. And the amount of money, it's insane. So they, their show was going to be in also in July, uh, the 12th, and they canceled, they postponed. You know, and, you know, not knowing if it's going to be available or not. They did, they decided, they decided 30 days ago that we're going to postpone because it's just we don't want to take the risk of people. <clears throat> you know, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, see, like right now we're going into May. You know, like they're saying we're going to go into May. So what's May, June, July? You know, so that's like. If things start counting and recovering a little bit, the economy a little bit, I don't think no retailer is going to have any money to really go to the show uh, if they're barely getting out of the, you know, two months of nothing, you know, because the only people who are selling right now are online, you know, people online, uh, Amazon and CI and Famous and all the catalogs are, they're doing, they're the only ones available selling because they're the only ones allowed to sell. And then the, st the shops that are open, they only can do curbside. So it's it's kind of hard to do that one-to-one, face-to-face hand sell. You know, so it's right. you know it's a lot easier to just go pop. You know, I like this, I buy it, and that's it. And and that's what's happening <clears throat> right now. So it's it's going to be very. I I think it's going to be very tough for for brick and mortars to really decide if they're going to go. If PCA does happen, it's going to be very hard for them to really go to that. You know, so. Um, it's going to be tough. It's going to, I mean, we're all going to a tough thing. Like I'm in the Republic right now. Um, you know, we have a very strict curfew, like right at five o'clock, nobody could be out in the streets. You'll get arrested if they, oh, I didn't they know see that. you. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. So, <laughs> That's like yeah. you're stricter than here. You guys have it easy. <laughs> I don't know where you, where you live. Oh, so I live in North Carolina. So you don't have like, uh, like Florida, I think it's uh, 10 o'clock. I think they're curfew, right? 10 o'clock, they told I me. I think so. But North Carolina, we're not under any curfew. It's just a stay-at-home order, but you can still go out to, like, the grocery store and get gas and medical appointments and, you know, that they said to exercise. <laughs> so so people are still getting out, basically. And there's no – I think there's a few cities in the, in the state that have had a few issues with people not taking the stay-at-home order seriously. So they have gone to a curfew-type thing, but 
our city, I mean, you could be out and nothing really bad is going to happen to you uh, law-wise. I mean, who knows after that, but yeah. Not, I didn't know not here. Were under a curfew. <laughs> not here. It's, we're in a strict curfew. You got to run to your house. Like, you know, it's like 3.30. You're like, oh, shit, I got to get going before they catch me. <laughs> so you like, know, come home. Like, yeah, because that traffic in the, in the DR sometimes can be it, it can be on um, Manhattan level, I call it. <laughs> yes, especially if you're half an hour away from curfew, yeah. So, uh -huh. so it, <clears throat> no, it's just tough. And you can't really have, like, get-togethers or anything. Like, you can't say, like, my neighbor down the street had, like, uh, over the weekend, it was Easter weekend. So everybody in the yard likes to go out and spend with their family and stuff like that. You're not supposed to do anything, like, any gatherings at all so he you know he's like it's my house i got a pool you know i got my like, family nope. over you know no he just started having like a little you know cookout whatever whatever and like you know and some neighbors right. saw them it was on seven or eight o'clock cops showed up with a paddy wagon <laughs> took them all <laughs> oh my god <laughs> dumped them all in the paddy wagon took them all it's like social distancing you're not supposed to do it so <laughs> crazy uh um, so now, nah, I mean, uh, what do you want to talk about? I mean, I'm here. I'm. Uh, what do you want to know about PDR and about Ape yeah, Forest? Yeah, I mean, so I want to know about Ape Forest. I mean, the the DR is interesting, but we can always Google a lot of um, that kind of stuff. Uh, we can't always Google information about you. And I know Tobacco Business did a story on you uh, a couple months ago, but like I said, yes. I, I. Uh, have not had a chance to talk to you and I don't know your story and I know that you know every year um, you know I've gone to Pro Cigar two years now and mm -hmm. you know I've, I've yet to do the PDR tour so I haven't like I said uh, gotten to know you and your brand well I do have some of your cigars and I haven't had a chance to even smoke those yet because like North Carolina is so strict on like where you can smoke it's just like it's crazy it's like can't smoke on sidewalks, can't smoke like within 200 feet of government property, which is like everywhere. So yeah. it's, it's even hard to find a place to, to do that in peace when you don't have your own home, which I, I rent. So um, apartment living right now. So um, that's not me. So what I wanted to do with this was like, just take the time to kind of get your story. And I know there's so many people that tune in and that will tune in to or watch it, you know, after we're done with it, um, you know, the playback to kind of get to know your story and, and, and more about you and your brand and how you got into the industry. So, um, well, I mean, you know, I, I think we should just start at the, kind at of the start beginning? at the, the beginning. Yeah. The beginning, maybe not at the beginning, but like a little bit ahead. So like, how did, you know, before you were doing cigars, like what, what was your focus? What were you doing? Uh, before I was doing cigars, I was, well, there's a couple of things I, I, you know, I wanted to be a musician, full-time musician. So I had a I had a band and I played out a lot and I toured and things like that. Um, but also I was a, a, a software developer, so I, 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 I like a website developer. So, uh, so MIS, that's why I studied marketing for information systems. So I did a lot of like um, right in the beginning of like cookie tagging technology, like behavioral marketing, like SEO. Uh, uh, search engine, search engine optimization, like, you know, uh, that type of technology in the beginning of dot com, you know, that's where I was like in the ground, like, uh, email, uh, buying email, selling emails, getting like this. Remember there was like a, back in the day, like in like 98 and stuff like that. People, like when the emails got crazy, like you would get spam like crazy. Then this, you know, then law came out about this, you know, opted in and opted out. So that was a big business back then. And, uh, I was in the beginning, I worked for a French software company in the beginning. And then I went to work for a couple of dot coms. And then I worked for a company called uh, um, Moto Media. It, it was a part of a Digitas. And they were right in the first cuff of like, like all the things that you get for free for Google Analytics, we used to charge $3 million for. That's, that's <laughs> how it was. So <laughs> a year. So like that type of technology that, that, uh, that, that Google just gave for free for people, hey, you can embed these, you know, these apps in your sites and yeah, you just pay us 50 bucks. That became, you know, that killed that whole business because we were in the beginning of doing the tagging, the interfaces, like 
the the dashboards where we you know I did ditech.com, gm.com. I was in, in the group that did a lot of these massive companies, uh, Delta, like behavioral marketing, like uh, you know when when GM was was trying to do uh, an advertising, and then there was like Kelly Blue Book and, and all these car sites, and they see that you're searching for a for a uh, GM truck or something, your computer gets tagged with, it, with, with a small piece of code that's, you know, you're entering your computer, even your phone says, hey, do you accept cookies? So back then, it's just to just, you know, drop that cookie in your computer and that's it. So that's a tag that came in our, our, that we dropped into you in the image. And then when next time you went to any site that had an ad that came up, it will recognize it and now it saw your behavior. And on our server said, okay, this guy, if then went to here, like this type of truck, they're just a color, let's load this ad, you know? And that's the reason that technology evolved. Now you see it on Amazon, you see it on everywhere you go. And, you know, you go somewhere, you're searching for something on Amazon and then you're on some other site and then you see an ad for an Amazon thing that you were looking at. That's, that's where it came from. That's the ground, the beginning for me of that. Um, I always did cigars. Like I always liked cigars. I, I grew, I lived uh, from Bonal, Dominican Republic. It's like very close to uh, um, the area where, where the farms where, where Fuente has in, in, in Caribe, uh, his farms out there. So I'm from that area, a little town called Fula, a little bit my front, it's like river. So I grew up there and in Santo Domingo with my grandfather. So my grandfather was a, was a grower um, of tobacco and coffee, mostly coffee. And we, like, everybody just smoked. Everybody smoked all the time. So from so we always had tobacco in me and coffee. Like, I'm addicted to coffee and they're going to smoke it. That's, that's always. So as I grew, went, got into the United States, I wanted to go back, but it was hard. And my cousin was bringing cigars into the United States. Um, and he would give me cigars to sell. And it was in the boom. And we just sell cigars. And I made extra cash and I bought bass guitars and and, you know, did what I needed to do to support myself. Um, afterwards, uh, the company, because Google came out with something cheaper, lost a lot of contracts, and uh, and then they got sold by uh, Digitas. And all I got, my employees or my my manager and stuff like that decided to go to California to work for Google and things like that. I didn't know what to do, so I started. I looked for an ad, and I really wanted to get into cigars. And there was a company called Turner Box, and Turner Box is a, they're still around in your state, as you, as you know, Craig Cass. Back then, Turner Box was the largest franchise of tobacco. I mean, high-end stuff. I mean, they were in every mall. They were the first ones to come up with, like, the shaving kits for men, like the, you know, nice colognes, things like that, gifts. You know, you walked in a Tinder Box, it was not just cigars. It was like a woman can walk in there and just buy everything they would need for their man, you know? So I went to work for them. Uh, I came in, they asked me three questions. Do you speak Spanish? I'm like, do you smoke cigars? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you know how to build sites? I'm like, here you go. He's like, all right, come in. And I came in as a director. Uh, I was pretty young. They made me, uh, but I had like a big portfolio of the sites that I built. Um, they gave me a job to, to build, rebuild their, their site to, to go into e-commerce and to also help with the distribution to all the other tuna boxes. They had about 400 to almost 500 uh, franchises at one point. They were big. I mean, they were like the McDonald's of the cigar industry, you know? So um, mm -hmm. worked for them for a couple of years, for three years. Uh, eventually I was like dived in into like programming, just getting all the modules ready and then getting the accounting module, the warehouse module and the marketing module and all that stuff. And then once I got it all live, then I had an assistant help me and do the SKUs there. And the, but I had a, there was a guy who was the buyer who dealt with the tobacco, you know? So in the beginning, I just let him do everything. Yeah, I knew cigars. I knew what I knew about cigars, Dominican cigars and stuff, but you know, I smoked other stuff, but I was so versed in every brand. This guy was an old time guy. He knew everything. He was whatever, but he was very, you know, he was kind of old dude, like just like mean, just, you know, just really wasn't open to like experiencing like other new brands and things like that. So people would come in and deal with him and he was really, He's like really mean to them, like really tough, like not mean, but he was just a little, you know, just kind of like, hey, you know, no, no, we don't need that or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like kind of yeah. not giving people chances and they go by me and then they, what are you doing? I'm like in a blackboard drawing up to like the next ad, you know, campaign, like what I'm doing for tomorrow, what I'm, 
you know, and they're like, who are you? I'm like, and I'm like, I'm Abe. He's like, oh, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm director here and I run pretty much, I run the show, you know, oh. and they'll give me a cigar, give me a couple <laughs> cigars, come back again. And then they're like, well, you know, they'll sit down with me. You got five minutes, hang out, we'll smoke with me. And then they go to him, they come back. And eventually the guys were like, you know more about cigars than that guy, you know? <laughs> so uh, we, you know, it's like, why aren't you in, involved with the buying while you're letting him? Like, you have way more of a bigger palate, you know, understand more about tobacco. You grew up in a farm. This guy really didn't, like, you understand about fermentation, from, you know about processing, you know about priming, you know about all this stuff, uh, you know, and, and you're really good with technology. Like, you really should be involved with this, you know? Um, and I was like, ah, let me think about it. And then, like, you know, and I just noticed, like, the guy was just, you know, I went to my boss and they said, hey, you know, let's do this. Let's let's save some money. I'll, I'll be involved with, with buying. Um, let's get this guy out, put him to another tinderbox store or whatever. And I'll manage this, this division. He's like, what do you know? I was like, okay, grab five cigars, give him five, grab me five, a couple cigars, take the bands off of it. And let's see who comes close to determining what country and maybe what brand. I was like 85%. He was like, like not even 20 <laughs> like he just he just named like you know and i told him just grab random random cigars you know what i'm saying and i just kept it general i was like well and i was pretty you know i smoked a lot so and i smoked other things i didn't close my mind you know so i was like yo that's a fuente that's a pepin that's it. And, and like that's a 601 I'm like i already knew like i could tell just by looking at the cigar and i look at the detail like okay this this has triple cap this has you know i just you know the way they close the foot that way the way the they're cutting the, the wrapper when they roll it. I can tell this from Nicaragua. Like I could tell, you know, the, I could tell from what a Dominican and a Nicaraguan cigar came from. So I looked at detail mostly because I'm a programmer. I have to be detailed. So he didn't. So the guy's like, okay. And then I was involved. I ran everything, the buying, the, the shipping and everything. And then I hired a couple of people to help me out. And that's when I started traveling and going with the buying trips and understanding more about running a factory making private labels. We launched a few uh, some private labels. We increased the profit margin for the company and we just started growing and growing and growing until one day I, it was time for me to go. And I just, uh, I, I, I remember the time, uh, you know, uh, I, I was still, you know, I wasn't 30 yet. I was like 29. And, and I said, you know, if I don't, I really did not want to continue in retail you know, or I didn't know, I didn't want to see myself continue doing what I did. You know, it's it was a lot of work, a lot of grinding, a lot of stuff. Twenty four hours, seven days a week. Running a website is not easy. <laughs> Dot com me, is very <laughs> hard. Like an e commerce site is seven days a week. You know, so mm -hmm. I, and I worked and I worked for dot coms in in Boston. Like I went to school in Massachusetts, so I worked in the ground one of dot coms. It's seven days a week. You don't sleep. You know, so I was tired. I was just like, I need I need to have do something I would truly enjoy and. You know, my music stuff was not really going anywhere, but I found myself really getting attracted to designing, blending, packaging, coming up with products. And I said, you know, I met these guys, Juan and Isidoro and the brothers and Luis from Don Lienzo. They had a shop in Canal Street and they had a little factory in Tamboro with just like four rollers. And they like, hey, you know, you know we could use you. I'm like, and I'm like, well, you know, I had a little bit of money, not much, like 10 grand, I think, not even 10 grand. And, um, and, and um, I jumped in at it and said, hey, if I, lose, if I don't make it in four, three, I'll give it three, four, five, I'll give it five years. If I don't go anywhere, I'll go back to what I did before and build websites again. So that's what I did. I came down, I started working, I blended something, I hop on a plane, go back, go to door to door. Hey, I'm in Flores, PDR, try my cigars. Um, and, uh, that's pretty much it. And then 15 years later, I'm, I'm here, I'm the youngest member of Pro Cigar. I got in and, and got in there like uh, five years ago. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I built it all. I built it from small with a dream and, and, and a passion and, and I just put my heart and soul into it. So, you know, that's all I got really, you know. When I when I design something, when I make a product, I just put it out there, and I hope people enjoy it. Just like the song, just like music, just like painting, you just hope people enjoy it. You know, right. that gives, gives me satisfaction when I see somebody posting one of my cigars and really like it. 
And then some people are going to hate it. Not every cigar is for everybody. It's like every artwork or like that piece I see behind you. Not every artwork or, 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 or every song people are going to like, you know, it's not for everybody. Cigar is not for everyone, but some certain palettes are more broader and certain, certain blends are more, you know, precise, you know? So I'm not, uh, I make cigars when I blend a cigar is off of, of the feeling I'm getting at that time, you know? So when I do blend, I look at things, I simplify and just like, just like programming, when you're building a site, you start from the ground up. Same thing, blending a cigar is like writing a song. You know, it's like, or for me, it's, I start with, when I write a song, a tune, I start with a beat. And for me, the beat is like the filler. So once I get a nice fat beat, rhythm, same thing. When, when I find a filler that I really like, man, I like this criollo from this farm. It's like, oh, okay. Let me, let me add some hi-hats. Let me add some, you know, let me add some, some kick to this. And the same thing, I do the same thing with the filler. I just start looking at it like if it was like an equalizer, you know what I'm saying? Like virtual EQ. And I start, you know, finding a nice mixer. And then the binder, the binder to me is like a bass guitar, you know? So drum and bass, they lock in. The binder locks in the flavor, locks in the, 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 the rhythm section. So you got that drum, you got that bass, you got the filler, you got the binder locked in. Once I got that together and I smoked that, I was like, and you can smoke the cigar just without the wrapper. And you can understand, it's like, you know what? I can, I can sell this just with this, you know? If you really like the way it's flowing in your mouth and the way it's, it's smoking and tasting and it covers your palate, and if you're really enjoying that moment, then for me, the wrapper is, it's, it's, it's just, uh, you know, a wrapper is the prettiest thing on a cigar, right? Okay? Most From bands. Like album cover. <laughs> exactly. So most bands, the singer is the prettiest thing, right? <laughs> right? So, you know, Aruba Levine or, or Maroon 5, you know, the, sing uh -huh. the singer is, you know, is the best looking guy. So you get the best looking guy, you know, so you, you find the best rapper that puts it all together, you know? So that's what I do. I look for the rapper at the end. The rapper is the, 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 the melody, the, 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 you know, hook. Certain, the hook of that, of that song. So when you're smoking the cigar, to me, it's, it's, I close my eyes and I look at it. It's like, if you, it's like a song again, you got the intro, you got the verse, it takes you like a ride, you know what I'm saying? Gives mm -hmm. you the chorus, gives you the bridge, gets the chorus back up again, and then the ending. That's that's the trip a cigar should. That's why they try to give you with a PDR cigar. Now, when you you talked about how you used to work with looking at kind of or companies that would focus on the behavior of a consumer, whether it's in the programming side or even when you were working in retail. So how did that kind of help inform you? Like when you were thinking about your own, like you said, the, your own compositions, I would call them. Like what kind of things that you kind of take into consideration? You say, oh, I remember taking, I remember when I worked at this place or when I worked, you know, when I was in the store working here, like what elements did you kind of pull in to kind of create, like help create a blueprint basically for you to go forward with PDR? Well, the thing is, like, again, like, you know, you just mentioned Auburn Coppers, you know what I'm saying? So we're living in a different world now. It's not like the old days where you can, you know, buy CDs from Columbia Records or Columbia uh, uh, CDs and you get, you know, uh -huh. whatever, 10 CDs for, yeah. for, for 10 bucks. Right. You know, the BMG, <laughs> the BMG Club, it's a totally different mm -hmm. thing, you know? So it's not the old days. So, you know, a cover, album cover, it was it was just as important to come up with a with a striking of a cover than the song itself, you know? So now where we're at now is videos. Like the video a video comes out before the C D even comes out. Like people need to catch their eyes. So, you know, there's something that needs to like catch the individual. So, you know, I try to first finish the the, the cigar, look at it. And sometimes like for example, like I look at the Criollito. You know, Criollito is a cigar that I blend it with, uh, you know, it, with 10 um, brick and mortars in, in Spain. And they, you know, we came out with a really a, a nice blend that doesn't overpower, has a white pepper, a lot of cedar notes, a um, little bitterness in the, in the front and the tongue, um, very smoky, a little dry, um, 
you know, a little bit of como se pasa. Pasa it's a little raisin, you know, uh, taste. Um, but it's a Criollo 98 wrapper, Criollo 98 filler, and San Andreas binder. And and it burns nice and white. And, and they just like the way it looked. And then they go, hey, I don't think this needs a crazy ass band. Just just make the wrapper, the band brown like the wrapper. So we did, we started making it brown. And then it was pretty big. And he's like, you know what? And, then, and actually the way this kind of shrunk in, it's like, it actually was like a circle, like a wider circle. And then they, they told me, just make it small, small, small. And like, we just started shrinking it. <laughs> and like, and, and then it was too skinny. And it's like, all right, bring it up again. And they just say, all right, the Criollito and Criollo means uh, native or, and in fact, what it was, cigar was a lot of, it was all Criollo in 98. And it was going to be called Criollito España. And then they go, no, just call it A Flores y Criollito. And that's how we launched it. So this band is not, this band, the packaging itself is very simple. You know, it's brown, you know, it's just a very old school, traditional. And it's like my number one selling cigar in Spain. Wow. You know, the cigar pretty much speaks for itself, mm -hmm. you know. And we started a cigar in Spain and it grew throughout Europe, throughout Europe. It's, it's, it has become, you know, that and my uh, half Corona tins are my two very biggest seller in, in Europe, you know, and from there, it just grew and expanded. So we have these, you know, half Corona tins also that we have in four wrappers, you know, Grand Reserva. And, uh, you know, in Spain, they like, in Europe, they like the smaller cigars. They also like big cigars, but, um, you know, in Spain, they, they really look for a good cigar for a good price. It's not over, it's not a super expensive cigar. It's a four or five, the Robusta, I think, goes for like four euros, uh, their price. Um, and it's nothing really, over, nothing crazy. It's just a simple cigar that tastes good. It's not bitter. It's not harsh. Uh, it's a cigar they can smoke more than one cigar a day and, and, and drink something with it and be comfortable. So we started with that. So then you got things like Grand Reserva that, you know, it's, it's a little bit more flashy, more gold, more, or whatever, but that cigar itself, I looked at it and I just saw it just needed a little bit more, you know, it just needed some gold to pop with my name, you know, some coins and, and some, you know, graphics in the back, some, some, uh, we have some like, uh, you know, there's some, there's some, uh, watermarks in the back of the tin and things like that. And even on the band itself. So it's, a little bit more detail on that. So, so I mean, I have cigars that are very simple in packaging and, and I have cigars that are more complex. It's it's just, again, it's like, the cigar has to speak to me and and in, as I smoke it, and the name of the cigar has to really speak to me. So either I dress it up a lot or I make it, a, or, or I simplify a lot. So I just, you know, and sometimes I'm wrong, you know? It's not, it's not, it's, you know, it doesn't mean I'm right, you know? Right. I just throw it, you know, come up with it, feel with it, you know, I think this is hot, this is not hot, and, you know, I you know, put a little, you know, a little saxophone on top of it, a little this, a little front, you know, and like, oh, it's cool, it's not, yeah, they don't work out, right, let's try it without it, you know? And that's, it, like, we've changed, like, same thing, like, 1878, PDR 1878. That is the longest cigar, that's, that's the first cigar we launched, because we started as Pinar de Rio, the company. And then we changed it to PDR because a lot of people could not say uh, Pina de Rio. And now I tell people PDR means Pudo de Dominican Republic. <laughs> I really don't tell them what it means anymore. Like it, it, when I even, people say, what PDR? Pudo Dominican Republic. When, when I first came out and I started working with Leo Reyes with his Dominican tobacco, I asked him, where, hey, Leo, where are these seeds are you getting from? Oh, I got it from Pina de Rio. I got this Corojo from Pina de Rio. I got this uh, Piloto from this. And I got... Uh, no, not Piloto. I got this uh, Habano Huerta Riva from Pinata Rio. I got this Corojo from Pinata Rio. And I got this, you know, and he's like always telling me about this stuff, Pinata Rio, and before I even launched. And I was like, oh, and I went online, oh, Pinata Rio is available. And that's how I came up with Pinata Rio because the cigar was 100% all tobacco seeds from Pinata Rio. But eventually we evolved where we started mixing a lot of different other tobacco from Nicaragua, Mexico, Honduras, uh, Colombia, you know, um, Ecuador. U.S. P.A. Broadleaf, yeah, it just the P.D.R. Pinar de Rio just didn't fit, you know. I, I, and and I think Puros Dominican Republic sounds better. And and also when we changed the P.D.R., it was a lot easier for people to say P.D.R. than mm -hmm. Pinar de Rio, you know. So somebody says uh, or they ask the question, what size is that Grand Reserva tin? It looks smallish. It's a uh, forty-six. 
by three and a half. So it uh, has a grooves in the back. So you can find that on uh, a lot of retailers. Uh, I think, um, I don't know, where, where is he located? <laughs> I think she'll, I think it's, uh, she'll let us know. But there was a question. Mm. Um, people did want to know how can they find more about PDR and where you're uh, sold at, I guess, here in the U.S. especially. So, so well, we're, like, you know, do you have some big retail partners that they can maybe check out online? Well, the, the thing is, we sell, it all depends, like, uh, where you're at. I mean, we, we sell throughout the United States. We, we do sell through some internet sites. Um, you know, what the new blends, pretty much the old sites have them because they, they, we, we, I told you, we changed a lot of stuff in the last few years. We had it last three years, uh, three years ago, I started rechanging everything with the Grand Reserve, the 1878, the packaging. And I also changed a lot of the way the blends were. So a lot of these guys had a lot of on with, with the older blends, not the stuff. I mean, it's good, it's aged stuff, uh, but it's not what we're really launching. Um, it's not what we're really doing right now for PDR for the brick and mortars. So some sites have some of the new stuff, new packaging. If you notice, they will have like a a, a, a paper, nice paper on the foot. A lot of the, the new like, stuff. Is it like this? Like that's actually that's the bigger version of this. Oh, see. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have so that yes. coordinated. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have the course. Yeah. So that's the deflorado. So uh, yeah, that's uh, everything now. 1878 has has a, a, a foot ban um, uh, from 1878 to Grand Reserve to AFR um, to to distinguish all the new blends and packaging and, and revamped everything. That's what we've been focused on in the last three years. So so some sites do have older stuff, you know that you know that you get a deal on and stuff, but. Really, if you want to smoke what's what I've been what I'm doing now and what exciting things I'm doing now, what blends I'm really pushing are the stuff that the brick and mortars have and the stuff with the new packaging and new bands in the last three years. So I would really yeah, I wouldn't say tell people not to buy the other stuff. That's you can at least it's like it's like looking at a <laughs> it's like buying a, a, a you, you look at a new I don't know you, a new Jay Z album comes out. You know what I'm saying you never heard Jay Z. But you want to see his trajectory, you're going to buy the old stuff just to see how he went. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, you want to buy his older stuff if they're still out there. Or when you're looking for old albums, you want to look at how the, the artist started and then how he is now. You liking the stuff now, you know, in the beginning, it was okay, you know? So I evolved as years go by. My blending changed as years go by. You know, my uh, I became more confident in, in my blending. I became more confident in my, my message of the company itself. Um, Make, became more confident in myself, and I and, and I think there's a lot of different things. And uh, a person that actually like kind of like, you know, he's no longer with my company, but I do thank him. Is uh, Richie Otero, who I think he's he's in there. Um, uh -huh. uh, he's 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 talking smack right there, but uh, he actually pushed <laughs> pushed me to like, you know, he he saw the new stuff we were doing and he pushed it like, hey, we well, got to push this out, push this out, and make people see what you're doing now that's much better. And we got it out there, and it, and we we getting pretty good success. People are really enjoying it. You'll find it a lot, and and you know we're over almost over a thousand retailers nationwide. Uh, we are you know chains like ABC, Specs, Binnies. They sell our stuff. You know liquor store chains. You know um, smoker friendlies have our stuff. Uh, tobacco Depot. So if you're looking for you know they have a lot of the new stuff, and some of the sites do have some of the new stuff, um, they're not going to be discounting it, you know, because I'm being very strict on the new, on the new stuff, you know, so on the packaging that and the product that we've been doing the last two years. Let's talk a little bit about pro cigar, because like you said, you are a pro cigar, the, like a member, which I don't think a lot of people always make that connection, but um, I mean, there's so many people in the U S that don't seem to know about pro cigar for some reason, because you go to the, the festival every year and there's a lot of international people and you know it's not a big u.s presence there there are some people from the u.s but i don't think people understand like how much of a a great festival it is and the opportunity to kind of learn about cigar culture 
like up close and personal. I think uh, Pro Cigar has done a really great job in promoting the industry overall. I think the Europeans have embraced it a lot better than the United States. Um, yeah. I, I, and you can see that. I mean, you go to the show, to the, to the festival, it's like, even at the tours, I have like, you know, 80% Europeans and like 20%. And I do get people from the United States, but it's mostly Europeans from right. Spain, Italy, uh, my, uh, whatever, you know, Germany, uh, Yugoslavia, like you just get all world flavors, you know, 38, you know, 200 flavors of people coming in. And it's like, you know, you, you know, and they all want to know about cigars. So They've done a great job of making it international. Uh, and I'm very proud of that, that made it international. That's the reason we sell out every year. It's super packed every year. You can't even fit another person at the at the white party. I mean, honestly, I think I was, you know, I saw a person almost falling off from the, because they were so tight to the corner of the freaking ledge of the of this year of the white party. There was not enough room. You know, it's like, we can't fit no more people at the monument, you know? So it's, it, we've done a great job pushing that. It's the you know ten biggest or the strongest manufacturers here in the Dominican Republic, from you know uh, Altria, uh, the, the Altidas, um, Davidoff, Fuente, La Aurora, Lito, La Flor Dominicana, Carrillo, La Palma, and EPDR. And, um, and did I miss anybody? Oh, Fuente. Yeah, Fuente's in there too. You know, so you got you got all these juggernauts in there. Uh, General Cigar, you know, all these guys, STG, like, groups, and I'm, like, the little one in the, at the end. Oh, and, and, and Reyes families, you know, the, uh, the Reyes, like, pretty much like Reyes and me at the end, in the bottom, and all these guys <laughs> that, you know, have, like, 100 years, 200 year corporations, you know, and I'm, like, this little guy in the corner, hey, yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you for accepting me, but they're very strict. The thing is, they would not bring me in if I did not have the ability and the standards, and, and they saw something in me, like, they knew me from when I was at Tinderbox and this, and they saw what I do with Tinderbox and how strict I am and, and how organized and uh, how I am with safety and, and structuring and, 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 and how workflow, how a company needs to flow visually, internally, everywhere from, from how people walk into the, to the door to how they leave, you know, everything needs to flow. So when you come into my factory, you can ask your partner there who, who came to, to, who did the interview, he could tell you it flows. So you can do the, you could go up to the whole factory within like five minutes and you can see the whole thing. You flow through it, you know, and, and that's the way I designed the factory. And it's divided in two, two phases, two floors. First floor is production. In the middle is the humidor, but on top is all processing tobacco fillers and, and deveining and preparing the fillers and the wrappers and binders for, for downstairs. So, it's um, it, you have to have a certain criteria. You have to have a certain amount of ratings, a certain amount of name recognition, a certain amount of distribution already. You know, I hustled. Like I started just like you know, I didn't have the money, man. Like I did every penny that I got in, I put it back in the factory. I put it back in the factory. I put it back in the factory. You know, and and everything I got is in the factory. So. If we all go to business tomorrow, I'm pretty much going to be calling you for a job. So, <laughs> you know, so it's I, I, everything I have in the last 15 years, it's just okay, make a little money. Okay, let me buy this special machine to suck the humidity out. Let me buy these things for to make sure the employees are safe or let me buy this. this every every time we have a little, you know, a little bit of money goes back in the company, back in the company. And I, and I invested back, 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 back and very little in for myself. Just, you know, I have my habits. I have, you know, I like buying instruments and that's what I do. And that's like really my, my addiction, you know, um, you know, if you notice, I got, there's a bunch of guitars back there, you know, so that's like really my, my, my addiction. So that's my problem uh, other than cigars. And, uh, you know, but everything I have is it's, it's in the company itself. So to be a member of Pro Cigar, it's not, it's, it, Hanky Kellner says, uh, we are a group of gentlemen. And is is in Santiago is uh, Santiago de Caballeros. So you have to be a gentleman, and you have to. It's not just being a member of Pro Cigar. You have to protect, portray the vet, the best image of a Dominican and the best image of a manufacturer and the best in, image of you know be, uh, of the Dominican cigar out there. And I think the people that we have, the companies that we have, portray a great image of the Dominican cigar worldwide. You know, and they've done a great job worldwide. And that's the reason. You know, 
you know, and the thing is too, like you get all these people from Europe because Davidoff is very big in Europe, you know, and you got a European company, like, you know, uh, also uh, STG, the European company, you know, um, mm -hmm. all to this, they're a European company. So they, they, I'm not saying they're not doing a good job in the United States, but they've been, a, you know, they, they do a great job of bringing a lot of people down from Europe, you know, so, and we, we're trying to do the same thing from the Dominican Republic. The problem is by the time the tickets go up, they get sold out like in two, like literally in 20, in 30 minutes, you know, they get sold out. We got no time like to like, to try to like you, we, we got to coordinate like a year, like eight months in advance to, to say, Hey, I'm going to bring like at least 10 retailers from the United States. And then I got to like, you know, pretty much wrestle their arms. Like you got to really commit because if not, you know, <laughs> they're going to yell at me because they could, you know, it sells right. out right away, you know? So, and I do bring, I try to always bring like 10 retailers down for, for, to view, to come down to the to the factory, um, you know, uh, this year I had a uh, found out a few days ago a really good guy, um, friend of mine, uh, Chris. Uh, um, I don't know if you saw my my picture. I was mentioning this this gentleman named Chris Olson, who uh, who's a very efficient out. Who was friend is a friend of uh, Bill Neeter, who had a shop in in Arizona. He brought he came down with two of his buddies. One of them was this guy Chris, who was a carpenter. I met from Arizona. And in the first time he came down, he this guy just fell in love with Pro Cigar. He's like, I'm coming all every year. This guy came like three years straight in a row. Like I saw him like at, at IPCPR. He just got addicted to it. He's like, you better hold me a ticket. I don't care. I'm coming, you know. <laughs> so like that's 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 what I loved when I when I get somebody like like they don't know Pro Cigar until they see it. You know, when they see exactly. it, they're like I, they're like, I want to be here this shit every year. This thing is, is insane. You know what I'm saying? This is a as a mega show, super exciting. You're like Every day there's something to do, and this year we did gr this great event in Lito's farm. Oh, it was amazing! Like they grabbed, uh, you saw it. Like they had everybody I was there, out. Yeah. You, were, you were there. They had like the, you know, the, the cookout with the pigs and like the the. Oh my god! Like it was insane. And then you get a little packet, and we were all like in like a, what was it? Like trading cards, and people can trade and stuff. Like, it was a, yep. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was an amazing day. You know, we came. I mean, I was so hungover, it wasn't even funny, but it's still, it was an amazing day. <laughs> So, uh, what I was saying, I would my, say, my buddy I Chris, more people, you know, meet more people from the U.S. would, would you know, get on board with looking at that because I know it's a little bit of a, a hike for for a U.S. person, but it's not that bad, and it's a, a nice way to kind of see the industry because until you see some of the factories and the fields and and the companies and how they put together the cigars and the people who are in the factories working, you don't you only you're only getting like part of the story because you're only getting the kind of end of the story when you walk into the humidor and see the everything packaged and nice and, and put together for you. So it's, it's, I think it's important for a consumer if they're able to do it, you know, for them to come down. And, and if you're really, if you really enjoy cigars and you really want to understand what it takes to make a cigar, it's not just stick you know some people are here oh this is just a stick you know just give me a stick it's not just a stick you know it's it's you know a, a friend of mine um yesterday told me uh and another i think the next year will be the five 500 years that the republic has been dealing with tobacco it's going to be like this this thing like i think it's next year that like the dominican government wants to do this big thing presentation about five yeah. we have almost 500 years where the Republic has been producing tobacco. So it's a history, it's part of us. And, and it's, it's not just a bunch of leaves wrapped together, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, families working every day hard, it's a crop, you know, it's something that people live from. And then, and, and it's, you know, and then guys like us and guys like Lito and guys like Pochi Blanco and guys like Hanky Keller, and like guys like Puente, you know, um, Guillermo Leon, you know, they, they they all they all put their hearts and soul in a product and then just hope to God that you guys will enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? Like when they put out then just hopefully you enjoy it. You know, because this is this is a little piece of me that I put out there. So what I, like, I give I like, you guys It's like Hanky hmm? always says, like he's sending out friends, you know, the cigars are his friends and he's sending them yes. out into the world. So that's kind of along those same lines. It is. He's sending one of his friends out and hopefully his friends doesn't get too beat up, and maybe they won't, you know, they will love him, you know. Right. And that's the thing. So it's 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 an experience that we're trying to give you, 
you know, and it's a little piece of us. So everybody has their own style. Like I tell people, you can grab five of us all together and give us the same components, Seco Biso Ligero, same tobacco, same seed, rapid binder, and put all five of us in there, sit down, roll a cigar. All five of us will give you five different experiences. Everybody cooks differently. Everybody works differently. Everybody plays a guitar different, a little bit differently. You know what I'm saying we're not all robots. We all, if we if you have a passion for it, you're gonna do you're gonna play your way. You know what I'm saying like you're gonna play the guitar like Stevie Ray Vaughan. You know what I'm saying you're gonna do your own style of blues. You know what I'm saying like that's you know that's that's the way. You're not gonna mimic somebody else. You're gonna be yourself. So that's the way I I, I perceive to what I've done. Um, and and it's very crazy because it's uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews online and stuff like that and the past you know because hey i'm locked up and uh yeah and a friend of mine is like you know why why do you don't talk more you know why why you're doing this now it's like oh because i'm locked up <laughs> and uh you know and and for me is i'm like the shy artist you know what i'm saying like i do my thing and i just put it out there and i just hope to people that to enjoy it and if you come close to me it's easier for me to, to open up to you on a phone because I'm looking at you and right. everybody else watching, but I'm looking at you. That's the reason like, you know, people like they see me talk and like, Oh, I didn't know you were like this. You were like, it's like I am because I'm only looking at you, everybody else in a crowd. I get, I get, and it's very weird. Like when I play music, like I'm just, I close my eyes and I get like zoned in. You know what I'm saying, but in a big crowd is, it's just it's a little hard for me to really have you feel what I'm telling you. I'm saying it's because I'm telling you right now, I'm looking at you and I'm mm -hmm. telling you how, what I feel about my art and I, and I can portray that to you and you'll feel it and you can get a little bit of hint of what, what I'm trying to talk about. So I think this medium is good because I'm able to portray my feeling out and hopefully people will enjoy it. Listen to it. Yeah. Them. And I know a, a few people comments wise. I mean, they said that you're, they like this interview. They they're learning more about you, and like you said, they feel that it's very genuine and and not, you know, structured. You know, a lot of times you do interviews in the media, and I don't know how other media people do it, but usually I'm doing it for a magazine, so it is very structured. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I have certain questions. I usually send it to the person just to make sure that nothing gets talked about that they don't want to talk about or. They can massage out the questions. And usually they answer the questions in the document, send it back to me, I put it into a story. So having like these, when I started doing this, I was like, what, what can I get out of this? And for me, it was just the art of conversation. Because like you said, usually when I see people like you, it's at an event or a trade show. And there's so many people <laughs> to contend with, yeah. with, so many distractions. And there's like announcements going on in the background. And there's you know, a whole group of people over here having a conversation like really loud, there's laughing, there's stuff. And you're just like, you can't concentrate and you can't have a, an hour long, you definitely can't have an hour long conversation like that. I P C R or, or any of, or TPE or, or any of the conversation because there's so much going on, which there should be. And it's like, people are doing business. But, you know, like you said, right now, I mean, everybody's a, a captive audience, literally. So it's like, you know, let's, let's connect and let's talk and let's get some stories out way because hopefully people will listen to this in interview and the other ones that I've been doing and they'll want to venture out into the stores and, and look for PDR now and they'll relate back to the stories that you told today. Listen to us talk and they just you know see two guys just shooting the, shooting the shit and talking about cigars and talking about their experience you know you know I'm just a regular guy man like I, this is this is something I started to do I didn't think I was going to last this long <laughs> between you and me <laughs> You know, so, uh, you know, and uh, I, you know, I, I somehow I keep, I'm still here. So it's, uh, you know, I, when I first started making the cigars, I, there were a couple of friends of mine who are still in the business now and who were making cigars back then. And um, I get Eddie Gab, talk about, <laughs> talk about Asia. See, Eddie, I, see, great guys that I meet, like Eddie Guerra. I met him um, in, in Thailand, like, you know, and that's the thing, like I was from the beginning, I, I, you know, I really wanted to focus on making my brand global. So I think I was like the first guy, like it, it, this guy Hillman had this, this these lines called um, 
these stores or these lounges called uh, Wizgar. It was like whiskey and cigars in, in Thailand. And he like hit me up and he's trying to bring all these brands in and, and stuff. And Eddie was working for them, for him. And he was, and, 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 you know, me and Eddie clicked like, you know, cool guy from Miami living in Thailand, you know, I don't know what the hell, you know, he told me, he's like, I'm working in Nikki beach. And I'm like, okay. And then he got, you know, working over there and, and dude, we came up, we did some amazing, amazing events in Thailand and the cigars are super expensive with the taxation and the guy, people loved it. I brought, I was the only one who brought a roller out there. We spent like 10 days, you know, every night, like wow. they motherfuckers start late. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, man, they start late. And like every night I was going to bed like at eight o'clock in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was so, it was so hard, you know, like you start, like you get there and like, you know, start doing the event and whatever. Next thing you know, you're like, you know, at four o'clock in the morning, you know, it's like four or five o'clock in the morning and the event is still going, you know? So it was late nights every night, but it was like a lot of drinking, a lot of smoking, a lot of socializing, a lot of you know interviews. I mean, we did four, four, I think we did like four magazine and like a lot of like, you know, Maxim, a bunch of, uh, Eddie can tell you, he did a bunch of different things and, and we got pdr really going out there and then that planted a seed there and planted a seed there and you know uh, we had a lot of good times over there and like we did a rolling event at nikki beach and phuket you know it was a, it was amazing you know and, and people paid to to do that you know those were good man i mean we worked hard there and then same thing and i started focusing on spain i started giving on france i started focusing on and that's how I build my name internationally and still have my distribution in the United States. And I just really focus on trying to be, build a brand, a more international brand. You know, I think for all, you know, I think every brand owner needs to look at United States. So one thing, but they need to really try to spend a little time on, on building more of an international presence, just a little bit, whatever. You know, I, when I first started uh, going to into tobacco, you know, I went there and I begged to for for somebody to just give me a shot. And some some many distributors like, all right, if you want, you bring a couple boxes and put it at the edge of this table. And if somebody asks about it, you know, tell them and maybe we'll sell. You know, if you sell these boxes, we'll order from you from your factory. You know, eight years later, seven, seven years later, I have a whole section in that same booth. You know what I'm saying of PDR, and it's just right. me and Perdomo. And like, and, and I'm his like, you know, 50, 40% of his business now, you know? So the guy gave me a shot and, and he's a Don Stefano, great guy. He had a machine, machine business, uh, a cigarette machine business back in the day, great gentleman, older gentleman. Uh, I think he's like 90 years old, like 89 years old, been around for a long time. Um, great family. Uh, and, you know, they only focus on one Dominican brand and one Nicaragua brand. And like, when we get there, we have a lot of, we have a lot of presence, but the guy gave me a shot. Like, he's like, I'm going to give you a shot because you seem like a hardworking young man. And I kept on coming every year, every year. And I will sell it for him at the booth, pitch it a little bit. I'm not knowing jack shit of German, you know, and just like doing my best to like, you know, I will speak English and trying to like hope the other guys like get it bring my samples and whatever. And the guy every year and the guy, oh, we sold a little bit more this year. We sold a little bit. And then every year, you know, eventually those orders started going in getting bigger, you know, 50 boxes, oh, hundred boxes. Oh shit. You know, 200 boxes, 500 bucks. And now it's like, it's grown to a decent business out in Germany. We've done, we're doing great in Germany. Same thing with Belgium. And the thing is what I tell people, it's like other brand owners, like, Hey, the first year you may not get anything. The second year people are going to look at you and like, Oh, he came back. The third year, they're like, that we're talking about distributors from other countries. The third year is they're going to be like, give you a shot, 50 boxes. I'll give you a shot, this. And then I start going, hey, you know, I'll come and do an event. I'll come and do take. And in, in, in Europe, if you've been to Europe, they're not really shot. They're like, you know, little convenience stores with a little closet for a humidor. I'll go in there and, I'll, you know, I'll try to sell my two boxes that he, that he bought, you know, and I'll do a little event after that. And that's what I did, and I grew it, grew it, grew it, grew it. Belgium is like one. Of, Belgium, Luxembourg, is one of my biggest markets, you know. And I, and I have a private label that I make for them, my distributors over there, cat, um, cat distributors. Uh, it's called El Coyote, and they're doing phenomenal over there in Luxembourg and Bel in, Be in Belgium. Um, then my distributor in in France, he's also a uh, Sandro, 
doing phenomenal over there. My distributor in Spain, I make another cigar for him called the El Saman. Um, that's doing phenomenal over there and, and, and a brand called Alternativa. So like I give, I, I, they sell my product, but I also make them partners where I, ha I make them a product for them own. Where I make a smaller margin, but they feel that they can, they have something that's theirs, that they can grow, that they have more of a, a stake into the business. And they know that we're going to grow together because if it becomes a brand that becomes pretty big, I'm never, you know, I'm never going to just change the distributor. We're, we're all working together for one goal. I never had, I think I've only had one distributor that, that, that I changed and now that changed, he went out of business and he, and he took money from me. Other than that, I've been with the same guys since day one, same distributors since day one. They gave me a shot, even good, bad times. We're still together. You know, a lot of com countries and like right now, they're having issues in Spain, Italy, my distributor in Italy is, you know, Ita, who's, who only distributes Davidoff, uh, um, Laura and myself, you know. So real quick, so they only have, and they we're, we're down to our last hmm? like minute and a half. So if you had to, oh, okay, if, so. if you had to pitch one cigar for people to kind of look for, I guess for for the U.S., what would that cigar be? I think the one cigar they should try is El Criollito. I think it's a cigar that that hits a wider pri uh, range of and palate. Uh -huh. um, if you can try the Criollito, you'll be very pleased for the cigar is going to, it has the, the spice, the, it's the cigar that I smoke the most and it's the most, most enjoyable cigar that, that I do make that is more, has a more wider range of flavor profiles and a lot of different sizes. So I think that or the half Corona, I mean, this is the, the Floral is my other cigar I smoke. And this is a creamy little smoke that, you know, it, I smoke those two all the time. So that's what I suggest. Well, thank you so much, like I said, for, for taking an hour out of your time to speak to me today. And I'm looking forward to now that I, I know you a little bit better. I'm looking forward to our next encounter uh, in person whenever that is. So whether it's well, PCA or, or some other consumer event this year, um, I look forward to seeing you out of quarantine. <laughs> me too, my friend. Well, thank you very much. Well, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah, definitely. All right. thank, thank you so much. Ciao. Bye. Bye.